Welcome back, and I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Before we proceed to panel five, I will ask my colleagues to post the fifth motion of the conference to the screen. And the slide of motion is, ICC's outreach strategy is an effective dialogue with victims, agree or disagree. And a reminder, I think you all know how to use Slido now. Um, so I will introduce panel five, and if everyone could take your seats at the bench as I introduce you. Our chair, Dr. Sarah Finnan, is a victim's rights expert with experience as a domestic prosecutor in Australia and at the ICTY and the ICC. She will preside over a very accomplished panel, including Sonia Robla, the ICC's head of outreach for nearly 19 years, Ibrahim Sori Yella, one of five members of the ICC Trust Fund Board of Directors, and a barrister and solicitor of the Sierra Leone High Court, who will be participating remotely, and Judge Raul Pangalangan, who served as a judge at the ICC and is currently professor of law at the University of the Philippines. Thank you for coming. You can take your seats. I see Ibrahim. And I turn the floor over to Dr. Finnan. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, Klaus, and the entire team at the International Nuremberg Principles Academy for all the hard work that you put into this forum, both the work that's visible to us in the room and also all the hard work that's been going on behind the scenes. I'm very honoured to be chairing this panel on outreach at the International Criminal Court, and I think we'll continue a lot of the themes that have come up this morning about victims' rights, the right to information, the right to be heard, the right to follow proceedings, to participate actively in proceedings if victims wish, and the right to reparation and assistance. Outreach forms an integral part of the court's operations, and it's a vital element to achieving its goals. It serves as an interface between the court and affected communities, making judicial proceedings more accessible and inclusive. When done effectively, outreach allows for a constructive dialogue with the court, which can in turn promote understanding and support for the court's mandate, and ensure that the court remains responsive to the needs and expectations of communities affected by crimes within its jurisdiction. Implementing effective outreach is incredibly challenging. Those responsible for planning and conducting outreach activities are often faced with situations of ongoing armed conflict or insecurity, perhaps a lack of local infrastructure, resource constraints, complex socioeconomic, linguistic and cultural contexts, and sometimes active opposition to the work of the court. In this session, we'll be discussing these and other challenges that the court has encountered in its outreach activities, as well as some of the key developments that have taken place over the last 20 years. And we'll also reflect on the court's current focus in terms of its outreach activities and what improvements can still be made. Before handing over to our distinguished speakers, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to frame the discussion by identifying a few key issues that our panel members may wish to touch on. This session is very appropriately titled, Who's Outreach and to Whom? I think a good starting point for our discussion is the goal of outreach. A clear understanding of the goals of the court's outreach activities, of course, informs the registry's choices and its decisions as to who it intends to reach and how it will reach them. Certainly one of the primary goals of outreach is to ensure that victims in affected communities are put in a position to engage effectively with the court throughout all the different phases of its activities. To do this, victims in affected communities need to be provided with accurate, comprehensive, consistent, and timely information about the court's mandate and the different opportunities for them to contribute to investigations, to follow judicial proceedings, and to actively engage and um, become involved in them. This needs to be done in a manner that's clear, consistent, and tailored to the specific context of a situation country to ensure that it can be understood. 
beyond the court's investigation and investigations and its judicial proceedings. Victims and affected communities also need to be provided information about the possibilities for obtaining reparation and assistance. While it's the registry that has primary responsible responsibility for outreach and public information, it's the trust fund for victims that is responsible for implementing reparations programs in, in, um, uh, in connection with judi judicial proceedings and assistance pursuant to its broader assistance mandate. The trust fund, given its mandate, potentially has more scope than the registry for consultations with affected communities and other stakeholders in order to understand how they conceptualise justice and what forms of reparation they feel may begin to repair the harm that they've suffered. And of course, in order to enable a true dialogue with the court, a range of other actors will also be involved, including legal representatives for victims, the VPRS, um, who we heard from this morning, and civil society. We're joined on the panel by representatives from the registry and from the Trust Fund uh, for Victims remotely. Uh, Sonia Robler has been involved um, with outreach since the very early days of the court as chief of the ICC's public information and outreach section. And Mr. Ibrahim Soriyila is vice chairman of the board of directors of the ICC's Trust Fund for Victims. Sonia and Vice Chairman Yilla will no doubt touch on the differing mandates of the Registry and the Trust Fund for Victims. I hope they'll also speak about how they coordinate with each other, particularly in terms of managing victims' expectations as to what assistance or reparation can realistically be provided. And we've heard from uh, Professor Pham this morning about the challenge, of uh, the challenge of managing expectations and the risk that re-traumatisation might result from a victim's sense or perception of being excluded from the process. While victims and affected communities are a natural focus for outreach activities, there are other key targets as well. In the Ongwen case, for example, the court's outreach program also made efforts to reach out to the accused supporters because they also showed great interest in the proceedings. For this reason, Dominic Omwen's own community was given an opportunity to see justice in motion. This ensured that his supporters could see that the ICC's proceedings were fair and transparent and respected his fair trial rights. And I'd like just to pause here for a moment and read a couple of quotes from community members about the screenings of the trial of, of Dominic Omwen in his hometown of Kurum in northern Uganda. Quote, we feel reassured seeing that Ongwen is well taken care of at the ICC, that he has a lawyer that represents his interests. And another quote, if anyone had told me that Ongwen was so well dressed and can even take notes, I would have dismissed that as a lie. Now I see, therefore I believe. These were both quoted by Lino Ogora in a report for International Justice Monitor in February 2017. I think these quotes highlight the benefits of outreach not only in terms of bringing the processes closer to affected communities and other stakeholders, but also in terms of addressing the misconceptions that may exist about the court. And in fact, it was the court's own field outreach coordinator for Kenya and Uganda, Maria Mabinti Kamara, um, who's been quoted as saying that the trial screenings act as a conduit that address the concerns and fears of communities, reinforce key messages, thereby dispelling rumours and creating a better understanding of the court's judicial procedures. We'll have an opportunity to hear about the concrete impact that outreach activities have had in, in this uh, situation of Northern Uganda and other situations from Sonia. And I anticipate she'll be able to share with us some um, concrete examples about what she's witnessed in terms of how outreach activities have facilitated engagement with proceedings and how they've improved local perceptions of the court and its legitimacy. We're also joined on the panel by one of the court's former trial judges, Judge Pangalangan, um, who will reflect more broadly on the important role that outreach now plays in the work of the court. I'm also hoping that we'll have time on this panel to dig into some of the practicalities of outreach. 
For example, how does the court engage with such a diverse um, audience in practice? How does the registry ensure that its staff has the necessary expertise and resources to work across so many different situation countries, particularly given that outreach has traditionally been an underfunded area? And given the limitations on its resources, how does it prioritise certain targets over others? What practices have been developed to foster a truly participatory approach to outreach? How do the registry and the trust fund coordinate with other organs of the court, including the office of the prosecutor, especially when confronted by questions or criticisms concerning prosecutorial strategy and case selection? How do they work to counter misinformation about the court and address open hostility to the court's activities while maintaining their neutrality? To what extent do they rely on external actors, such as the media, community members, international organisations and civil society, to ensure that they reach all intended targets, including vulnerable and marginalised groups that might otherwise have difficulty engaging with the court? And drawing on Ingrid's comments this morning, um, before lunch, what strategies have been adopted to address gender inequality and gendered barriers such as literacy rates, particularly where a situation involves gender-based violence? I've just listed quite a lot of questions, so I'm going to pause at this moment and hand over to the panellists so that hopefully we can get some answers to these questions. Uh, and I think we'll start with, uh, with Sonia. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and good afternoon to everyone. I think that uh, to understand the outreach at the court, it is very important uh, to put it in, uh, in context. So please allow me to make a brief reference uh, to the uh, development, the evolution of the outreach um, at the ICC. The outreach activities were not even mentioned at the uh, Rome Statute, but based on the experiences of the ad hoc tribunals, outreach was incorporated at a very early stage as a very or essential function of the ICC, and it was recognized as a such by the Assembly of the State Parties already in 2005. And one year later, in 2006, the court has the first outreach strategy in place. Now, before continuing, I would like to um, uh, give a definition of what outreach is trying to have a, a, a focus and a meaningful discussion, I think it is important to understand what, what we mean by outreach at the court. And it is clearly defined in the regulations of the registry. And I quote is Regulation 5Bs, outreach programs shall be aimed at making the court judicial proceedings accessible to those communities affected by the situations and cases before the court. This is what it is outreach stricto sensu at the court. Now, the first outreach strategy was based on the experiences of the ad hoc tribunals, but uh, we had also the experiences, I would say, invaluable experiences of the civil society, the uh, members of the uh, uh, coalition that um, enthusiastically, really enthusiastically supported us and contributing to our work from designing the strategies to helping us um, with the, uh, the first steps in the implementation. But soon it became very clear that the work that the ICC was doing was completely different to the one of the international tribunals, the previous one, the ad hoc tribunals. Why? We were working in uh, often situations where there was a still an ongoing conflict. We were working from a distance, which was not the case at the tribunal of Sierra Leone. We were working simultaneously in various countries, languages and cultures. And even in some cases, the court was not even welcome. It is something that we discovered very soon when the warrant of arrest of al-Bashir was issued. Um, working in such an environment uh, for all of us, the first steps were actually a question, a process of trial and error. And why not to accept and why not to admit that we made a lot of mistakes? For example, the day of the opening of the uh, trial of Lubanga, which was the first trial at the court, we had organized a um, view inside a screening of the proceedings in a venue in uh, Bunia, in Ituri, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the affected communities were. 
And we thought it was very important for them because no one had television at that time uh, in that area. So it was the only way actually for them to follow the proceedings. And uh, we gave a lot of publicity to it. Uh, we used the community radios that we were using and we put posters and we told to everyone. And then the trial started and um, uh, soon the venue was full and uh, the trial continued and the people continued arriving and then the doors were blocked and people continued arriving and the windows were packed and people continued arriving until it became or we reached the situation of serious uh, concern that led to stopping the screening and, the evacuate, or to, and to evacuate our outreach uh, officer that was there. Um, in another occasion, also with the first trial in the Central African Republic, in this case, we had an agreement with the national television to broadcast the whole opening statements. After a few hours, I don't know, they decided that it was maybe too boring or too long, I don't know what, and they cut it. But the problem was that they had broadcasted the majority of the opening statements of the Office of the Prosecutor, but they didn't broadcast it anything of the uh, opening statements of the uh, defense, neither the representative of the victims. So it was a horrible starting point because everyone thought from the very beginning that it was a trial that was already unfair for the accused and that the decision, in some way, the decision of the judges was already cooked. Mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, was not the, first, uh, the best uh, beginning of, uh, of a trial that you can have. Now, since then, a lot of things have changed at the ICC, uh, also in the environment around us. Uh, there were a lot of developments in the field of communications with the internet and the social media, and naturally, the outreach programs have changed a lot. Now, the main lessons learned, and uh, therefore, the, the basic components, the basic pillars that inform our approach are the following. First of all, Outreach is a two-way communication. We have, we have to listen to the communities. Secondly, outreach has to take into account the judicial phases of the proceedings because the needs of communications are completely different. The affected communities are not only the victims, stricto sensu, but also other groups um, in the country that are relevant, such as the legal communities, NGOs, local NGOs, academia, naturally the media, and also eventually the members of the army, the police, the members of the parliament, and as you said, the supporters of the accused. Another pillar of outreach is that we need to rely and work together and in partnership with the civil society to increase our impact. And finally, and this is probably the most important one, each situation is unique. Each situation requires a tailored outreach strategy and a tailored approach. And then, based on knowledge and the understanding of each specific environment in which we are working, we might need to communicate in Swahili, Lingala, Sango, Tagalog, or Fur. We might need to use mass media, such as radio, television, or communicate through WhatsApp or Facebook. We might use theater performance, animations or town hall meetings, or since more recently, Zoom to conduct information sessions with local leaders. Um, before entering into the, uh, the challenges that uh, we are facing now, let me remind you the situations that are currently before the court and where outreach activities are conducted to a greater or less extent. Listen to this. Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, Darfur in Sudan, Central African Republic, Kenya, Libya, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, Georgia, Burundi, the state of Palestine, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Afghanistan, the Republic of the Philippines, Venezuela, and Ukraine. Okay, what are the most important challenges that we are facing? In Spain, it's siesta time, so I'm not going to make the whole list because you will fall asleep, but I'm going to focus on those that are the most relevant. And I would address first, uh, firstly uh, and very briefly the political uh, uh, context, the challenges that come from the political context in which we work, 
Um, and uh, I'm referring in particular to these situations where there is a lack cooperation, of cooperation, where the, the, the court is not welcome. Um, the, the outreach uh, really faces uh, uh, important challenges because uh, if we cannot open a field office and if we cannot even travel and enter the country, the result, um, the, the, the result is that, that the access to the affected communities is extremely limited. And um, uh, often this lack of cooperation goes hand by hand with problems of security. And this is a, a challenge that we are facing clearly in the Philippines, uh, in Afghanistan, and in some way in, uh, in Sudan, among other situations. Now, another interesting challenge, in, a challenge that was mentioned uh, here, I think, by Bill a few days ago, was the dissemination of fake news. Um, could be fake news or very well organized campaigns against the court or the elected officials of the court. Now, while the new technologies have brought uh, very good new opportunities, uh, we are aware, all of us, of how quick false information that can damage seriously the image of an organization uh, can fly and without any control. We had in the past uh, experiences, uh, Fatou is uh, not with us anymore, but uh, she was personally attacked as well as uh, Silvia Fernandez in the past. And uh, the day before I came, we had uh, to report on a fa false Facebook uh, page of the prosecutor the day before I came. Um, what I can anticipate is that in the current environment in which we are, the future is going to be probably much worse. I'm going to refer now to the, uh, to the challenges that are linked to the nature of the work of the court. And by this, I refer to... Um, um, I mentioned before that uh, the outreach has to be linked to the different uh, phases in the proceedings. And one of the challenges that we have seen uh, based on the experience is that during the period of the investigations, there are um, a lot of months and sometimes even years in which uh, there is very little to be said because the uh, investigations are conducted in a confidential way. And this um, creates, after um, a few months and a few years sometimes, uh, puts us in a situation that we exhaust all the messages that, uh, that can be said. And um, very um, easily, the affected communities become disappointed when there is a lack of information. And uh, this is happening already in the situations of uh, Libya, Myanmar, Bangladesh, uh, Burundi, and Afghanistan. Lengthy inf uh, investigation phase that leads to lack of information and disappointment of the communities. And uh, last but not least, I want to mention a challenge that is related to the resources. Resources that are required to conduct outreach in an increased number of open investigations. Because new situations, as I explained, do not only increase the number of affected communities that expect information from us, but also generates a need of a staff with cultural expertise, with language skills, translation and production of information materials, mapping and establishing of networks, and building trust with local NGOs, media, academia, legal communities, etc. Now, without mentioning again the amount of countries where we are working, and taking out of the 17, five, because we have country offices with quite limited capacity of outreach, except for two, from The Hague, we are conducting the outreach activities in 11 countries, with three staff members and 40,000 euros. And I talked yesterday to an NGO that was here, and she told me that for one country, they have 11 staff members and 400,000 euros. Then I thought, mm, there is something wrong with the outreach at the court. Um, I leave it there, but uh, I know that we all have to deal with problems of resources, but I think this is quite significant. Um, I don't. Uh, I see that I don't have a lot of a lot of time. Um, I can maybe give more more information la later. But I would like just to mention that uh, despite all, all, all these challenges, a lot 
a lot has been done at the court with a lot of creativity, using innovation approaches, thinking out of the box, relying on partners, and whenever possible, seeking uh, for external funding for specific uh, projects. And like this, uh, we are, uh, for example, uh, conducting, I think, uh, very, very good outreach activities in the given circumstances in the, the situation of uh, Darfur, which is uh, very challenging in the sense that uh, there is an ongoing trial, there is no office in the country, no possibility for us to travel, uh, but with a lot of innovation and a, a very creative uh, approach, as I said, and with the support of the local NGOs and affected, uh, the affected communities are kept very, very, very well informed. We disseminate a lot of information through the radio. We have managed to install a view inside without the problems of Congo, uh, for a screening of the proceedings in one of the camps. The NGOs sent out questions the, the, from the affected communities that will respond with videos and animations that are shown also on the screens. We have conducted hybrid activities with the Bar Association, with the local NGOs, with leaders of the communities and with media, and we maintain WhatsApp groups uh, where even live interviews uh, for media are conducting, conducted. I'm not uh, going to, to continue giving examples. I would not be able to give you a detailed um, report on all the, type, the, the activities that we are conducting in the different 11 or 17 countries. Uh, but um, I think that, um, that in the majority of them, uh, we have open good lines of communication. We organize virtual information sessions. We might maintain uh, WhatsApp groups uh, with the key stakeholders. We produce and share materials in all languages through social media, etc., etc., etc. Now, uh, if you ask me if this is enough, I would say this is far from being enough. But I firmly believe that in the given circumstances, the court has put an effective, efficient, creative innovative system in place. And uh, as it was said in the last days here, the court is just an actor in the system created by the Rome Statute. An outreach has to be a shared responsibility of all actors of the system. The court plays a role, but also the civil society and the states. And only working together, we will be able to make a real difference and ensure that justice is done, but also seen as being done. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sonia. I think we all really appreciate you putting um, outreach in context for us based on your vast experience working in this, in this area and with so many very concrete examples of both mistakes and uh, successes over recent years. Um, I'll now hand over to Vice Chairman Yila from the Trust Fund for Victims, who's joining us remotely. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I bring you warm greetings from the board of the Trust Fund for Victims. Uh, let me start by apologizing for my absence, which is due to very pressing personal reasons. Nevertheless, the board considers events such as this forum as an opportunity for us to outreach. In other words, to, show, to showcase what the board is doing and the role it is playing in the home statute system. Um, despite my physical absence, the board is represented by our acting executive director at the forum, Francisca Eckelmans. It demonstrates the importance that the board of the Trust Fund for Victims attaches to events of this nature. Um, as you said in your introductory remarks, Sarah, by profession, I am a lawyer. And I had looked at the question posed by the motion. Uh, let me give a caveat here. Whilst I'll be addressing outreach concerns, challenges, and opportunities for the, by, for, by the court generally, let me start by saying that um, 
I will be focused in the first part of my presentation on the outreach strategy of the Trust Fund for Victims and the impact that this strategy has had on victims and affected communities in situation countries. Uh, let me address firstly the question posed by the motion. The central question posed by the motion is, whose outreach and to whom? It's a very interesting and timely question. And my response will be biased. Forgive me for saying that. As a board member in the Trust Fund for Victims, I have looked before coming to this debate closely at the preamble to the Rome Statute. The reason why I started looking at the preamble is for me to discern what are the objectives of this statute? What is the role of the Rome Statute? What is the role of the legal system, the court established by that statute? I, I draw your attention to the words of the preamble. They spoke, these words speak repeatedly about victims, about accountability, about prevention of crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. And also significantly, the words of the preamble to the Rome Statute speak to complementarity. I would therefore say that I'll pose two answers to the question posed by the debate. And as we move along, I will substantiate with evidence why I came to that proposition or that conclusion. My answer to the first part of the question, whose outreach? As I said initially, I'll be biased. I will submit that for my reading of the preamble to the Rome Statute, it is the victim's outreach. This outreach is not only confined to victims, but other actors associated with the process set up or the legal system set up by the Rome Statute. And for the second part of the question, to whom? Well, principally, I will submit that the outreach, the primary focus for the outreach should be, again, for the victims, the affected communities, and other stakeholders envisaged within the system set up by the Rome Statute. Now, for outreach, let me use five minutes of my time to point out what the Trust Fund for Victims, the strategies it has put in place, the collaboration it has had with the Public Information Unit of the Registry to amplify the work that it undertakes on behalf of the victims of crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. Um, for, for us in the Trust Fund for Victims, outreach is not only central to our work, but it is critical. Our outreach strategy, as distinct from the general court system, has two twin objectives that we have identified. The first strategy is to reach out to victims and affected communities in situation countries where ICC undertakes, where the International Criminal Court undertakes its work. The second part of our outreach strategy is for visibility of the work and competence of the trust fund. What, 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 what do I mean by this? The point, the, my, the, what I'm trying to say here is that whilst we do our work to reach out to victims and affected communities, we also do outreach to fundraise on behalf of these victims. And to achieve our fundraising objectives, we, we, we increase the visibility of the, of the fund. Now, how do we do this in practical terms? So the strategy put in place by the board uh, together with the Secretariat of the Trust Fund for Victims can be summarized as follows. One, the Trust Fund for Victims undertakes early intervention in situation countries. We all know, and we do this together with the public information of the Department of the Court and the Registry. What are the advantages of early intervention in situation countries? It would assist the board and the executive secretariat to understand 
what the culture and political climate in that situation continues. It would also assist the board to identify who the key actors are in that, um, in that situation country. But also, it would also assist the board and the, exec and the, and the secretariat to identify potential partners in the civil society world with whom the board and the executive secretariat can cooperate in order to reach out to victims. The second strategy put in place is continuous engagement. How does this exec how does the board and the how do they how do the board and secretariat achieve this in reality? The, the partner with reliable NGOs, civil society groups on a continual basis to reach out to victims and affected communities and to continually inform them about the various stages of the legal process and about reparations and assistance program. But also quite significantly, and I must point this out, and I must commend the Secretariat for this submission I'm about to make, is the involvement of victims in the design of not only outreach programs, but also in the design of reparation programs. So the, the Trust Fund for Victims, in other words, has put in place or, and continues to put in place a victim-centered participatory approach to not only its outreach, but also to the design and the implementation of its reparation and assistance program. Now, in terms of visibility, as I indicated in the early part of my submission, the board also has an obligation, also duty, to fundraise on behalf of these victims. Practically, as you are as you're all aware, most of the persons who have been convicted by the court are indigent. I think all of them. So the court, the Trust Fund for Victims has a duty to fundraise on behalf of victims of crimes in situation countries. Um, how do we do this? We do this by continual engagement with embassies, with donors. We have undertaken projects together with quite recently, I think about three weeks ago, um, the board led a mission to Northern Uganda, which was funded and supported by the Irish Foreign, the Irish Foreign Ministry. And um, quite recently, I undertook activity on behalf of the board in Mali, by which as vice chair of the board, I sat with the community in Timbuktu, discussed with them, they gave their input, we listened to them, they spoke to us about what their expectations are by way of reparation to their community. I mean, I'm here, here I'm referring to the Almadi case. It was quite interesting. Let me share a few of the experiences I had. You know, we sometimes we move into these communities thinking that we have an understanding of what the solution is to them. But what we did as a fund was firstly to listen to them, to hear what their expectations are, what would constitute reparation to them, how, do they, how would they want this reparation program to be designed, how would they want it to be implemented. And at the conclusion of that meeting in Timbuktu in Mali, I came to the conclusion and all of us in that room, including the local communities, including the victims, came to the conclusion that the community has taken local ownership of the process. Now, what is the ripple effect of this? When you make a local, and, and I'll be addressing the courts subsequently, the court strategy, but I just wanted to point out in this early part of my submission, what are some of the strategies that the Trust Fund has put in place? What is the ripple effect of this? The ripple effect of this is that having taken local ownership of the process, it gives rise to legitimacy. They accept it because we collaborated in the design of not only the reparation programs, but most significantly of the outreach program. They gave their input on how other members of the affected communities could be reached. 
they gave their input on what would constitute collective reparation or uh, um, collective reparation. They gave their input on how to move forward. By this way, the trust fund is creating a situation where by the, look, um, the people of Timbuktu, this, in this example that I've given, have accepted and they have taken ownership of the process. So once they take local ownership of the process, failure would not be an option. Yes, we, can, we could measure the extent of the success, but they will do their utmost to ensure that the process of which they have taken ownership succeeds. Now, the second part of our outreach, which I spoke about, relates to visibility for fundraising. How do we do this? Um, Sonia Robla, in a statement, spoke about the use of modern technology. Um, we use we, 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 the, the trust fund uses its website, the court's website, Twitter, and it has the use of this modern technology has increased over the last two years. Permit me to give you some data in just one minute of how um, um, of, of how the trust fund for victim uses um, um, modern technology. In 2021, the Trust Fund for Victims posted 626 tweets and gained 516 new followers, ending the year with 1,902 followers. In 2022, in the first and second quarters of 2022, the Trust Fund for Victims published eight press releases to a total of 13,000 300 recipients, posted 223 tweets, gained 243 new followers. I have taken this sample of the statistics that's provided to me by the Secretariat to show the steps that have been taken by the board to increase the visibility of the board. We tweet, tweet to embassies, we tweet to foundations, but also one of the things that we noted in recent times as a fund that is increasing the visibility of the fund is also through third-party tweets. The fund is now being represented in third-party tweets from embassies, from United Nations bodies, and for international civil, uh, from, um, civil society organizations. Let me conclude this part of the, the role of the trust fund and its outreach strategy by saying that the fund has also collaborated with international NGOs, and um, also it brings the visibility of its work. The, in the last ASP session that was held in um, 2021, several programs, side programs, were prepared by the board um, for the attention of the ASP and also other stakeholders. Now, to the court, the, to the court, um, out the court's outreach strategy. Um, let me refer again to what I submitted earlier on the preamble to the Rome Statute. My own view, having read the preamble a couple of times, a question comes to mind. What is the role of the court established by the Rome Statute? What is its purpose? What is its objective? Um, I will submit that among other things that have been identified, of paramount objective in my submission will be one, accountability. Two, communication and reaching out to victims and affected communities, which is also part of accountability. And thirdly, complementarity. There is a reason why in the early part of my submission and in this part of my submission, I'm emphasizing complementarity. Um, so having identified what the purpose, so in, in framing out and adapting new outreach strategy, a question should be posed continually as to what is the role, the purpose and objective of the courts. Let me highlight some examples here. Some of the African countries I mean, I represent African states on the board. Some of the African countries have not, those with dualist system, 
after having ratified the home statute, they have not, some of them, have not domesticated as required by their various constitutions the home statute in local legislation. What is the effect of this? The effect of this is that if you if the court were to announce investigation in a country into a particular situation in a country, and that country belongs to a dualist legal system and has not domesticated the home statute, the basic statute, then how do you expect cooperation from that country? What will be the role of victims? Now, let me move one step further from that. And that is why, that is why I think complementarity is actually key I mean, to the objectives of the home statute. After the amendment to the home statute at the Kampala conference, again, my research discloses, at a, at a recently concluded conference that I just attended, the research discloses that several African countries have also not, those that have implemented, for dualist countries, those that, those that have implemented um, um, the home statute as domestic legislations, they have not even amended the domestic statute to accommodate some of the amendments that were made to the home statute at the ASP conference in Kampala. So what is the what is what is what is what is the conclusion on this point? The conclusion is outreach, yes, it should focus on situation countries, on victims and affected communities. That is my bias as a member of the board of the Trust Fund for Victims. But most significantly, outreach should also be part of continuous engagement. It should not only be responsive to countries or situations in which investigations are announced, but it should also be public education and continuous engagement with member states of the uh, uh, to the home statute. I mean, do you have a statistics of how many states that have ratified the home statute have domesticated a legal regime that would allow for victims' participation in their domestic legal system? That would allow for cooperation? So the success, as we discuss, as we unpack these issues, the success of the outreach of the courts should not only be measured in terms of what the court undertakes, but also in terms of complementarity. How many member states have enacted or created a legal system in their country to provide for cooperation, to provide for victims' reparations, to provide for victims' right to justice? How many member states, after the amendment to the Home Statute, have amended their, their domestic legislations to take into account those amendments that were proposed at the Kampala conference. Um, another, another issue that I may, that I wish to address, um, I, I've just been reminded of my speaking time. In just one minute, um, I'll conclude. Another issue I wish to address is what is the role of the Office of the Prosecutor under the statute? Because in most countries or in most situations, uh, territories where investigations are carried out, the local community tend to confuse the, the office of the prosecutor or the prosecutor for the court as a whole. And perhaps we could draw a lesson from my tribunal. In addition to my role as the vice chair of the Trust Fund for Victim, I am the, I'm one of the principals of the residual special court for Sierra Leone. I'm the principal defender of that court. And the outreach strategy of our court has been globally acclaimed. One of the success of the outreach strategy of the Special Court for Australia was early intervention, and secondly, was the in in involvement of the defense in its outreach strategy to get legitimacy and acceptance of the court. What do I mean by this? In outreach events organized 
by the current registrar, who was then the outreach officer of the court. She included representatives from the office of the prosecutor and the defense. And they all spoke on the role of the defense, the role of the office of the prosecutor. This way, legitimacy and acceptance of the court increased. A similar method could be employed. For instance, if registry or the public information department is undertaking um, um, outreach events, and then they ask about the prosecutor's strategy, the prosecutor's case selection strategy, who's better placed to answer that question than a representative from the office of the prosecutor? So these are the reasons why I say we probably have to in include, in the case of ICC, include in key outreach events, representatives of the defense, representatives of the victims, and also representatives of the office of the prosecutor, so that the local population can see the different actors involved in the process. Finally, what is the role? The local communities have to be informed about what is the role of the court, the judiciary in the court, and the office of the prosecutor. An issue that won't, they, they may want to consider going forward is Article 54. It is the role of the prosecutor to investigate incriminating and exonerating evidence equally. How has this been conveyed to the local population? The effect of acquittal. These are, I, these are information that should be deployed to the advantage of the court. When there is an acquittal, despite the satisfaction from some members of the community, others can be told that this can increase the legitimacy of the court. Um, let, I, let me give the opportunity to the others. I thank you very much for this opportunity. And once more, many thanks to Klaus and the Nuremberg Institute for inviting the Trust Fund for Victims. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Vice Chairman. I'm sure there will be questions um, when we open up for the Q&A, particularly about your experience going to Timbuktu in, in the Ahmadi case. But for now, I'll hand over to Judge Pangalangan for a bit of a broader uh, perspective on the importance of outreach. Thank you, thank you so much, I'm sorry. Um, for me, the best way to appreciate the place of outreach and public information is to see it, is to take a few steps back and see it historically. Um, in the old school, a court speaks only through its decisions. A decision should speak for itself. A judge who makes the mistake of trying to explain his decision outside his courtroom outside the text of the language that he wrote, makes himself vulnerable. He steps down from the pedestal, opens himself to open contestation with just about everyone else, especially political commentators, journalists, barbershop pundits. And the moment he shows that he is in any way swayed by public opinion, that is the beginning of the end. And, the, uh, and he thus relinquishes the, um, uh, the, the sanctuary that he, he enjoyed in his role as a judge. Fast forward to today. It is unthinkable, simply unthinkable, to have an ICC without outreach or public information. Uh, we will not have the legitimacy. We will not have the effectiveness. We will be unable to inspire judicial cooperation with, uh, by states. It will be difficult to embolden witnesses to step forward. It would be difficult to inspire confidence to victims to turn to the court and be sure that the court cares, cares about them, that they're just not numbers in the record. Um, so for me, the challenge is how we got to this point, looking, well, judging the ICC, not as a creature of law, but as a creature of history. And here, uh, let me put on my hat as a law professor. The first chip shift is epistemological. You know, in the old world, the world I'm more familiar with, the legitimacy of a decision derives from the integrity of the judge, of course, and the integrity of the decision. The solidity of the reasoning, how the judge marshals the facts and the law to arrive at a conclusion. There is that inner satisfaction in looking at the draft, well-crafted, well-written, framing the legal argument, interpreting uh, legal doctrine. But notice in the entire exercise, 
The audience of the judge is his fellow lawyers. It is not the lay public. Uh, and that is why being too technical is not a bad thing, because he is not supposed to be popular. I recall as a kid, I went to a Catholic school. When I listened to a priest, the more Latin he used and the less I understood, the more holy he sounded. <laughs> you know, it's more like God can hear him better. And it doesn't matter that I didn't understand him because the real audience was God anyway. And I went along. So the same thing with judges writing judicial decisions. But today, notice the difference. I'm so glad uh, Prosecutor Moreno Ocampo used the term judicial logic in contrast to, well, in that context earlier, the, the logic of reparations. Uh, let us apply this to the Bemba acquittal. Um, just imagine trying to explain to victims the decision in the, um, in the acquittal. And I'm not taking sides here. I'm just taking a pedagogical standpoint as a teacher. Explaining to them that, yeah, sure, you victims, you have proved your victimization. Yeah, indeed, it's on the record. But you see, um, the guy was acquitted. And under the rules, we can't give you anything. And then explaining to them the distinction between a de novo review and a deferential review. Spending perhaps 30 minutes, one hour to explain that. Now, put yourself in the shoes of the victims listening to that explanation. He asks his seatmate, what did he just say? And the seatmate says, he says it's all over. We get nothing. In other words, all the hundreds of pages that we lawyers are so proud of can be summarized that way by the victims. And maybe that is all they care about. It's all over. That is all that the court um, said. And that is why for me, outreach is so important because we have to bridge the gap between us as judges, speaking as proper judges, and uh, sad to say, the difference between that, that and us as well, human beings, fellow human beings of those victims waiting for reparations. Let me proceed. The second change, I think, is not really just about us. It is about the audiences we deal with, the publics we deal with. Uh, yesterday, Professor uh, Laila Sadat asked, about, asked uh, Judge uh, Ebo Osuji about the negativity among the bloggers. Well, I think it's also about the changes in, the, in academic careers. That maybe, for the, especially for the younger professors, they have to be the first to comment because then they set the terms for subsequent discourse. But there's yet another factor. In the old days before the internet, if you say, just wait for my comment, it's coming out in four months. <laughs> uh, today, as uh, Judge Abosu, you said, it came out two hours after a 400-page uh, decision was, um, was released. The next change is this. This is actually in our program. A 2009 study on outreach, ICC outreach in the Central African Republic said that if the outreach was done online, the audience was basically urban, male, educated, and rich elite. So notice, we've got here a social and gender a demogra demographic determined by the, by the medium that we use. And that medium, again, as uh, Sonia says, will have to depend upon the context we are dealing with. And now let me give you yet another context. My own country, the Philippines. I ended my term as ICC judge, came home, and uh, uh, there was the um, Article 15 request to open an investigation of the Philippines. I come home, I came from the ICC, where the debate was largely legal, proper, all about the Rome Statute. I come home and the debate is just about politics. It is all about Duterte. And um, they don't care about other modes of liability. Uh, it's all about command responsibility uh, for them. All the questions that were about how to nail uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the president. And typical, again, of Philippine politics, if there was a point they wanted to say, they will tell me, why don't you talk to the prosecutor? You know, it's par for the course back home to do that, but not at the ICC. Um, in fact, the latest was when the prosecutor filed a request to reopen the, uh, the investigation just uh, in, in May of this year. But the timing was rather uncanny for the Philippines. It was five days before the presidential elections. And it was seen as a warning shot to the, well, the incoming president, the, the son of the, uh, of the former uh, dictator. Let me proceed to the third change. 
I think it's fundamentally also about a change in the definition of justice itself. Again, in the old view, justice was all about um, fancy legal footwork by very bright judges and lawyers. And today, the real test of the justice that we, get, that we give at the ICC, for me, is victim reparations and victim participation, giving the victims a sense of ownership of the justice that we are giving them. And um, for me, I didn't realize how powerful this idea was until I was, uh, I was in Rome for the drafting of the Rome Statute. I, was, I sat in the Bassioni Committee, and I recall um, one of the hottest debates was the codification of the crime forced pregnancy, the um, practice of ethnic cleansing uh, in Yugoslavia, <clears throat> where women who were raped uh, were kept in like baby farms to force them to give birth to babies of mixed blood. Uh, and um, the Vatican opposed the, uh, the codification, saying that, well, you're using international law to legalize abortion uh, in domestic legal jurisdictions. But the Holy See had actually a very professional legal argument. They said, from a purely prosecutorial interest, it doesn't matter if you codify it or not, because it is already covered in the catch-all provision. And that is, well, technically correct. I sat in the Ongoen uh, uh, case. We did that for forced marriages. It is not codified. We, uh, we uh, well, convicted uh, Ongoen uh, for that crime under precisely that clause. Well, the Vatican was rather prophetic in that regard. But for me, the turning point of the debate, because eventually it was uh, codified, was a panel by uh, victims who said, it is not enough to prosecute. You must call the crime committed against us by its right name. And that is part of the justice that we seek. And for me, it was a mind-turning moment. And until then, I thought, uh, I was actually worried you won't have a, a, uh, a Rome statute um, at the end of, of the conference because of the deadlock on this uh, provision. Okay, by way of closing. Um, I'm quite big. Uh, on, uh, on the dangers of the excessive judicialization of, of, uh, of reparations. Fine, we follow all the, uh, guarantee, the fair trial guarantees at the stage of pretrial, at the stage of the trial. But at the stage of reparations, perhaps we should change our mind view and see it from the standpoint of the victims. Um, well, as the uh, as, uh, president of Mansky said, there is a price to be paid for victim participation. It, uh, but it is a price that we must pay. It is part of the institutional design and of the philosophy of the, uh, of, of the court. Uh, and the, but when it comes to excessive judicialization, the cost really for me is difficult to justify. Uh, it delays proceedings when in fact many of these decisions are best made not by judges at The Hague, but by people in the field, people face to face with the victims, people who know their situation. Uh, also in terms of being sensitized to the needs of the victims, I think it is excessive judicialization is rather too distant and indifferent to the risks that victims and witnesses take when they step forward to the um, uh, well, first, starting with the suffering that they endured, and, and also their patience in waiting for the entire legal proceeding before we get to that stage when we start uh, talking, um, to, uh, talking about uh, reparations. Um, I'm so glad that we have this forum, because again, when we speak of reparations, well, it's only now, 20 years later, that really have any, we have any reparations stages to deal with anyway. It would have been purely abstract and theoretical, say, uh, 10 years ago, or even just maybe um, seven years ago. And it is now that we have the concrete experiences that Sonia and Ib Ibrahim uh, shared with us for us to look, I'm sorry, the chair went down, to look at the um, importance of outreach and public information. Thank you. Thank you to our distinguished panelists for these presentations. We now have approximately 50 minutes for discussion, which our chair will facilitate. 
Um, she will lead some discussion amongst the panelists to begin, and when she's ready, we will open to the audience for questions and also online questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to begin the discussion by returning to the question that I posed in the beginning about the, the goal of the court's outreach activities. Um, and this has come up in, I think, each of the, uh, the interventions that you've made. Um, I'm wondering if we can turn our minds to whether outreach should be limited to promoting and to promoting an understanding of the court's mandate and making judicial proceedings accessible um, and inclusive, or whether we should perhaps be thinking bigger than that. And I appreciate, um, Sonia, that your unit is working within the framework of the regulations and also within um, certain resource constraints, but I'm hoping that we can step back a bit and look at outreach within the context of the entire court and all the different um, actors that may play a role. So should we be thinking bigger? We, we heard from Philip Ambach yesterday about um, the potential impact that outreach and victim participation can have in terms of breaking the cycle of violence and deterring, um, deterring future crimes. So is that a realistic or appropriate goal of outreach? Should outreach or the communication activities of the court also be uh, aimed at assisting in the investigation um, and the prosecutorial and judicial work of the court by increasing support um, and by improving cooperation? And should it also contribute to the ICC's broader goals in terms of strengthening, uh, strengthening the rule of law and deterring mass atrocity? So perhaps I'll start with you, Judge, if you have any comments on that. Um, well, I think any exercise to explain the work of the court and the decisions of the court to a larger public uh, will have that deterrent effect, uh, will have that, well, in some contexts, a therapeutic um, um, effect and and for me the um, uh, the challenge then is how to explain it in the different ways that different communities need uh, uh, to, to see it so for instance a victim uh, community might want to um, well in my, in my experience they they are always happy to know that there is a, a label for what was committed uh, the crimes uh, they are uh, well again in different cultures some um, uh, they are impressed, actually, with, with, with the legal technicalities, with, with uh, the, the, um, the evidentiary rules, for instance, uh, have a certain allure, I notice, for, uh, for, some, um, for some victims. Um, uh, but at the same time, I think the, the larger message, especially when that uh, conversation filters through uh, uh, the larger uh, media, is to remind them that there is such a court as the ICC and that there is a court of last resort. Uh, there is the, the duty of domestic uh, courts to... Uh, to act and uh, that there is a recourse if they don't. Thank you. Sonia, I'll give the floor to you if, if you wish, rather than focusing solely on the, on the work of the registry, perhaps uh, you can speak a little bit about the importance of the partners that you're, that you're working with and the, the need to leverage support of other actors. No, honestly, I'm very happy to answer your question if we should look uh, uh, broader, because the answer is definitely yes. But this is a question of purely terminology, and let me explain to you. I wanted to focus the discussion on outreach because this is what we are discussing today. And um, when uh, we adopted this uh, definition was because we wanted to ensure that uh, the uh, affected communities have a special um, communication um, strategy that they are, uh, they are treated in a special way, that we take into account the special uh, circumstances of each community, of each country, of each, each culture, that, um, that we convey that sense of, um, that we empower the communities through the information that we provide on the court and on the proceedings, because they are entitled to know, because otherwise what we do in The Hague will be purely a theoretical exercise. Now, having said that, Naturally, the court has to have other kind of communication strategies that thinks broader, that goes beyond that, that aims at getting support of the court, that came, aims at um, improving the perception on the legitimacy of the organization. 
And actually, there are some other programs that are working on it. Also, some of them under my responsibility. But um, um, again, I think that the, uh, the, the concept that we have of outreach, which is based on uh, the experiences of the other tribunals, puts the victims or the affected communities as the center of the communication. And the most important thing is that uh, the goal is not what it is important for the court, but what it is important for them. And this is the key aspect of outreach. If we, if we stick with this idea of, the, um, of this sort of narrow, if I can call it that, um, understanding of outreach, I'd like to maybe ask you about the final report of the independent expert review of the ICC, which recommended that registry begin carrying out its outreach activities at an even earlier stage from the outset of the court's involvement in a situation country, um, including during preliminary examinations. It argued that delays in commencing outreach activities may allow for misinformation to take hold and thereby force the court to start its work at a massive disadvantage. And I'm citing from uh, paragraph 394 of the report. And yesterday we heard Professor Beth Simmons also make a similar comment that publishing proceedings or judgments is too little too late. Um, and that outreach needs to start much earlier in order for it to have an impact. So my question is this, is the registry interpreting its outreach, outreach mandate too narrowly or do the regulations um, define outreach too narrowly? Or alternatively, are we asking too much of, of the outreach unit and the registry? Well, I think it was Ambassador um, Um, in this case, I think that uh, I was saying that uh, Ambassador Benavesser said a few days ago that uh, probably sometimes we are expecting asking too much of the court from the court, and I think this is exactly uh, the case in this situation. Let me tell you, when we, we started with the outreach activities, I was the biggest fire, fighter, uh, fighter for, um, uh, to defend uh, the uh, early uh, outreach activities in the preliminary analysis. And I had a lot of fights also with, uh, with the team of the, uh, of the prosecutor, Prosecutor Moreno, at that time, because I was truly convinced that was really needed. Now, after uh, so many years of experience, thinking with a practical perspective, honestly, if we think that we have currently 11 or 17 situations open, three people, 40,000 euros, if on the top we have to add the preliminary analysis, I don't know how we would do it. But the main problem is that um, um, the way in which the preliminary, preliminary analysis was conceived, that lasted for such a long time, when you uh, conduct outreach activities, you have to put systems in place. It is not, you know, I issue a press release or I put a, tw a tweet. It's a comprehensive strategy that takes into account the special circumstances, the culture, the language, everything, the context, the political context, uh, the logistical changes, uh, challenges, uh, the ways of communications. So um, those, those, this requires to put very um, heavy systems in place. Now, how do you do that when the uh, preliminary analysis is done, it's going to continue for you don't know how many years, uh, you exhaust the messages, uh, it's, it's really a question of, of capacity and to be very honest, it's a practical approach. But if you ask me as a matter of principle, the answer is yes, the outreach activities, the information should start as, uh, as soon as possible. Why? Because there is evidence that when we don't do it, others do it and then we have serious problems. I might um, hand the floor back to Vice Chairman Yiller if he'd like to comment on, on this. Um, or perhaps I can add another question um, for you to address. And, and that is, um, could you speak maybe a little bit further about your engagement and your reliance on um, external actors, including civil society? We've heard about the, um, the resourcing issues of the, of the outreach unit, and I understand the trust fund's resources are also somewhat limited. So to what extent are you harnessing the support of other actors in the field to, um, uh, to support your work? And to what extent does working with these external actors pose perhaps some difficulties or challenges? We, uh, that was a novelty also in our strategy in 2006, because uh, at that time we already acknowledged the, uh, the importance and the need to work and to rely on the, uh, 
on the uh, uh, NGOs and the civil society. And if it was important at that time, now it would be impossible for us to operate without uh, the support of uh, external partners. Now, uh, when working with them uh, throughout the history, we have faced uh, different challenges, for example, um, security. Uh, there are situations in which uh, there are serious challenges of, uh, of uh, security for us, and this is mainly the reason why maybe we are not in the country, but also for them. So uh, sometimes for the uh, NGOs to, to, to work with, uh, with us or even to, to be, and this is something that we are, uh, we are uh, a challenge that we are having now in the situation of the Philippines, only the, even with for, me, for media, even the, the, the perception that they could be uh, close to the court uh, might create a, a problem to them. But uh, to make it short and also to, to have the, uh, the possibility to get other questions here, um, for us is, uh, there is no other way to work uh, than with the, uh, the civil society, not only uh, because they, 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 they can arrive to places where we cannot, because uh, they have uh, very good networks, but very often also because they have the trust of the affected communities, the local leaders, and um, yeah, they make our life uh, much more easier and uh, our work much more efficient. Vice Chairman Yellow. Thank you very much, um, Sarah. I believe there are two questions, but um, given the current chart I'm wearing, let me first address the, the question of um, how do we work as, as a board at the trust fund, how effectively do we work with um, local partners? Um, as I said in my earlier intervention, I submitted that um, we have program, we have country officers in various situation countries, and we enter into partnerships with local NGOs and civil society groups. But we don't, we don't just enter into partnerships blindly. In the early part of my submission, I spoke about early intervention. And what, what is the effect of early intervention? Early intervention enables the fund to assess the reach of any potential partner, the reach, in other words, how effective it can reach out to victims. We can assess the trust and confidence that is posed in any local partner, that is any NGO or civil society group. And also, we can also assess the reach and width of these partners to local leaders. It is having made all those assessments, we, we, we study them carefully, conduct other, use other means to reach out to victims, to assess which among these partners they support before we enter into partnership agreement with them. I mean, whilst I support this for the, the the trust fund in order to be able to reach out to victims, local leaders, and community leaders. As a, as a lawyer, I would not support the Office of the Prosecutor's reliance entirely on working through NGOs because it has its own role. It has, its, it has a different mandate. An excessive reliance on NGOs and third party, of course, may lead to collapse in cases. Now, to the second question. Oh, let me just give you the example of Mali again. When I was in Mali, in Timbuktu, the local community took control of the process. Um, they even proposed designing how to roll out the outreach strategy to reach out to other victims. We listened. We were essentially turned to listeners. And with their increased participation, they took ownership of the process. And once there's acceptance and legitimacy, or once there's acceptance and local ownership of the process, it makes our life better. And these are the victims that are referred to in the context of the home statute and in the preamble. They, have, they take over their process, that helps us. They want to design, they have to help design outreach and how to reach other victims, that helps us. That also helps fulfill our mandate under the statute. Now, the second question that you have raised, in the early part of my submission, I also spoke about the importance of complementarity. Now, should we have 
should the court be looking at a bigger outreach strategy? My submission is yes, for the following reason. Um, let me relate the example to complementarity. Public education should be considered to be part of outreach. I mean, the definition of outreach containing regulation 5B of the regulations of the registry would probably have to be considered or a term of public education included. To what extent has this court engaged member states? It is very important. And I speak, it's very important for me as a board member of the Trust Fund for Victims. Because where legal systems in situation countries have legal regimes that provides for victims' rights, victims' rights to reparation. And that's, that, and it's also a question I'll be throwing to this entire body for our debate as we go along. Well, as to what is the legal status of the right to reparation for victims under customary international law. But where this court engages member states, potential situation countries, to adapt or to implement laws that make it possible for the application of the Rome Statute legal system to take into account some of the amendments that have been made to the Rome Statute and to take into account the rights of victims to participate and the right to justice, that would be helpful. So these are the bigger picture. This is the bigger picture that I think the outreach strategy of the court should, should, should undertake. This is one of them. There are many more examples of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. I might hand over to you now for... Okay. We will turn now to questions from the audience, and we will begin with Prosecutor Ocampo. Thank you. I'd like to challenge a couple of points made by you, Chairwoman, at the beginning about uh, uh, is outreach about judicial activities and victim reparation. You're missing the beginning, the prosecutor investigations. And second point, the idea you have that we have to do outreach on legal matters, that's not the big issue for people in Bunia or, or in Darfur. But I like Ibrahim's point about um, how to balance the prosecutor and the defense at the beginning. And my last point is Ibrahim's proposal to do outreach for the state parties. That would be a great idea. Not sure the state party will support it. Not too sure the party would put money to be lobbied themselves, but it's a very yes. fantastic idea. So let me start very briefly. Why the prosecutor need to do outreach? Because the prosecutor, has, the prosecutor has no police in Congo or in Uganda or in Darfur. So the prosecutor need victim trusting him to come. That's why Karim Khan is going around inviting people to help him to do investigation in Ukraine because he needs that. They need to trust him. So that is by, and it's not about legal proceedings. It's not about what's happening in court. It's the beginning. And that's a crucial part. Then Ibrahim presents the challenge. How today can Karim Khan include the defense lawyer point of view? He, is, is Karim asking putting an appointed lawyer to defend yourself and then we talk together? No. How to do that? Karim is doing his job. He's doing, we are doing impartial investigation, investigating all the sides. That's fine. But it's still just the particular talking. And it's not about how will be the proceeding. It's about the crime committed and victims need to be protected, legally protected. So that's the main important point. It's not about just court proceedings. It's about other activities at the beginning, prosecutor activities. Uh, and um, so my second point is the idea, I think is right, Ibrahim, about do now to the to the state party, but that cannot be done by the court. We should invent NGOs or, or Hollywood or filmmakers or BBC doing this. BBC has to be lobby because BBC also presents badly the ICC activities. So we need to block BBC first. So that for me is the issue more complex. And I like, I think Judge Palangalang explained very well the complexities. Judge, as you rightly said, judges talk through the sentences. Who read the sentence? No one. Of oh, 10. That's the problem we have. But you're right. Still, the legal community is 
the monitoring system for the court and the judges and the prosecutor. So we still need them on board. So, and probably I know the judges will task Sonia, and, and then it's very important to focus on this first circle. The f one important audience is a legal audience. They have to understand what the court is doing. And probably that's, you could do that. Then, how to expand to the other dimensions of what we are doing, you cannot do it. You cannot, you cannot do it alone. Just to finish, it's funny, because you made big efforts to, to disseminate the Lubanga opening statements. But, you know, we invited NGOs to the prosecutor office, and, and Invisible Children was convinced to do Connie to the 12th video because of what they perceive as a big problem. I remember one of the Invisible Children leaders told me, you have a brand name problem. Why? No one is here. I was very proud because in the opening statement where BBC, everyone, including Angelina Jolie was there. But for the Invisible Children guy, we were so bad. And in fact, one year later or two years later, one year later, he did Connington to 12 and reached 120 million viewers in six days. That is outreach. But of course, 30 minute video is nothing about, about court proceedings, zero about court proceedings. So, because it's emotional. And, not, if we, and that for me is the issue on outreach. You need outreach for judges and lawyers and discussing the, the sentence, very important. We need to respect the principles as Ibrahim presented, but to be massive, you need something else. And that's why I like this session showing the complexity, outreach exposed the complexity of the system created by the SEC. Thank you. Uh, Judge Abu Suji, would you like to add to that? And then perhaps after that, the panel can respond. Thank you very much. Um, my good friend, the uh, Rao, Judge Bangalang, and you did not point out that it's also easier to read a one-page blog than 400-page judgment. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> it's about um, um, a question Mr. Yila posed and a story that Ms. Robla told. Uh, Mr. Yila's question was, what is the um, ICC doing by way of outreach to explain that acquittal is a part of the process. And it looks like from what uh, Sonia said in her story, it looks like to an extent the uh, community already understands that. She told the story about how uh, people walked out because there was a screening and the only what was shown was the opening statement of the prosecution and not that of the defense. Of course, they would not have known that the opening statement of defense would come at the beginning of the case for the defense, but they thought the case was cooked and all that stuff. But that takes us now back to the question that was posed earlier in the past uh, session about uh, acquittals being perceived to be failures on the part of the ICC. I think that is a dangerous perception for the court. People cannot create that impression that the chambers of the ICC, uh, in a way, international star chambers, anyone who gets in there doesn't come out regardless of what the evidence shows or fails to show. Now, we are in this courtroom 600. I do not know how many people in this room now know or remember that 76 years ago, Von um, Pepin, right, was acquitted completely of all the charges against him. And so was Hans Fritscher, of all charges against him, acquitted in the famous Nuremberg trial. At the ICTY, 18 accused persons were acquitted by the ICTY. ICTR, 14 people were acquitted by the ICTR of all the people they prosecuted and tried. So I think it would be very, very wrong to expect that everyone who goes to the ICC, who is indicted at the ICC, must be convicted, otherwise the court has failed. I thought I should mention that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll return to the panel for any comments you wish to make. Yeah, I would like briefly to, to address uh, uh, two or three issues that were mentioned by the prosecutor. Um, 
One is, uh, uh, the first one is, uh, refers to the, uh, the need of um, uh, providing messages uh, from the Office of the Prosecutor at one stage at the beginning of the investigations. And it was also mentioned the need of incorporating in the outreach activities the defense at one stage, which was a very good experience of the Tribunal of Sierra Leone. This is exactly the essence of outreach. This is how we've been working for a lot of years. The outreach is basically a mean to um, communicate different messages that is linked to the judicial proceedings. And the judicial proceedings start with investigations. And uh, if not with a preliminary analysis in some way, I know it is not the most uh, uh, legal way, but uh, it is in terms of outreach, uh, how we approach it. And uh, during the phase of the investigation, the most important uh, messenger is the office of the prosecutor are the messages that are related to the office of the prosecutor. And then when the, the, the warrant of arrest is issued, the messages come mainly from the chamber. And then later, during the trial, the first phase, uh, during the, the, investi the, the phase of the uh, prosecutor, the messages will come again from the prosecutor and later from the defense. What I mean is that we incorporate in the different phases of the proceedings the different participants. The second uh, point that I wanted to address is the issue of the complexities, which is indeed a, a very interesting one. Um, we um, wrapped, let's say, the messages in different ways, depending on the target group. So we don't present the information in the same way when we are addressing the legal communities, that when we are addressing the members of the parliament, that we are, when we are addressing the affected communities in a small village in Darfur, or in, camp, in Darfur, sorry, or in a small village in the Central African Republic. These are completely different ways of communication that we take into account. Now, I want to refer to the language of, uh, used by, by, by the judges, which is very interesting, but I have a very good example. Because what happened to us is that when there was an important sentence, the judges would have this uh, public hearing full of legal terminology. Believe me that at the end of the hearing, no one would understand what was the final decision. And by no one, I mean the affected communities that were sitting in a room or in a village looking at the, uh, the, in, the in a viewing, organized, uh, viewing site organized by the court, looking at the screen. They had no idea what the judges have decided. And w that was a serious problem. But even for us, because we wanted to make a simple uh, video program or a simple radio program, and it was impossible to find one or two sentences, something which, is a, 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 which within a reasonable uh, period of time would explain what was the final decision of the judges, because it was full of references to Article 5, 6, I, B, C, I don't know what, a list of, of, of things like this, two pages, impossible to understand. So, um, during the, um, before the uh, decision in the ongoing case, we talked to the chamber and we said, listen, we are going to organize uh, viewing sites in Uganda. This is extremely important for the communities. We've been working in Uganda for 10 years or 15 years, I don't remember. It is important that they understand what you are going to say. So, um, they took uh, our advice into account. And believe me, that decision was, or decision of the summary that was written in the courtroom was absolutely brilliant. Summarized at the end exactly what everyone needed to understand. Gave a strong arguments that were appealing, as we were saying, to the emotions, which is how the messages arrive. There was, yeah, legal arguments, but they left all the legal terminology to the sentence that we will put later on the website for the legal communities. But that summary was thinking in the affected communities. And believe me, was so well received that it is probably one of the first, the best moments that we have had in terms of outreach. That decision. That just two quick uh, points. I acknowledge the, the, uh, uh, the point of Prosecutor Moreno Ocampo that even in the old world anyway, uh, decisions had to be interpreted by uh, 
first by the, by the law journals and the bar associations. So I'm not saying that uh, the different uh, audiences and interpretive communities did not exist then. Uh, yes, of course, there are layers of, um, there are intermediate layers of, of communities and interpretations from the core hard juristic material to the softer uh, public uh, and popular material. But I think the real change is the shift in the, like the test of validity. Because uh, uh, today it's almost like consequentialist. They, people don't care about the reasoning. They just want to know who won. And uh, like uh, going back to what Sonia uh, was describing, a process where you're briefing um, the public about the decision and uh, in the scenarios I'm more familiar with, all they want to find out is who won and who lost. And, um, and I'm, I'm so glad that the Ongu uh, uh, draft uh, uh, summary uh, was, was well, uh, well received. Um, I think I know who were responsible for that. But um, <laughs> um, on, the, um, on the point of uh, uh, Judge Ebo Suji's um, uh, first quip that uh, the blogs are easier uh, to read. But you're absolutely correct, uh, Chile, but th that is a fact of, of life. That is the, uh, these are, the jargon is the platforms, the communication platforms on which we, we, we manage the opinions about the court. Uh, so there are platforms which, in fact, will impose limits on the lengths of the, um, of, of, of the comments and, uh, and that, uh, uh, therefore, um, the, uh, the fact that our decisions have necessarily are long because we have to manage the evidence. They have to be properly documented and um, uh, with uh, good um, citations. Uh, then the challenge is to present exactly what Sonia described, which is uh, a, uh, a reader-friendly summary, which still catches uh, uh, the nuances of the of the decision. Although I I sort of want to hold back a bit, uh, Sonia, on what you said with enough emotion. Again, I'm too much of an old school lawyer. Uh, the emotion part, you know, I recall what Oliver Wendell Holmes said, uh, great cases like hard cases make bad law. And I want to be able to arrive at a decision, still make it readable and uh, appealing to the audience uh, without, uh, without too much um, uh, emotional um, uh, ammunition. Uh, let me close to that point. The one of Holmes. It's a very good example. Vice Chairman Nilo, would you like to respond? Yes, um, let me take the opportunity to thank him. Um, it's good to see my former boss, Luis. Good to see you. And whatever one may say, um, we must commend Luis because at the time he was prosecutor, the court needed to take off. And somebody, you know, some action had to be taken. So in respect of the four situations and cases arising from those, we must commend the prosecutor for that. But let me take on two issues. Um, one raised by um, the judge, Judge Chile, and the next by Luis. I mean, that relates to acquittal. And in the early part of my intervention, I spoke about the role of the prosecutor's office under Article 54 of the Home Statute to investigate incriminating and exonerating evidence equally. I mean, of course, although in, in reality, that could not be done. But if that could be tied to a quitter, that would make outreach from the Office of the Prosecutor and the Registry, important to accepting the outcome that may come in cases before the court. That the business of the Prosecutor's Office is not only to investigate incriminating evidence, but also exonerating evidence. And for people to be prepared in local affected communities, to be prepared in advance to accept whatever outcome may come from judicial proceedings in the courts. But now to a big question. And um, that is where Louise refers to some of the interested parties, the stakeholders, the legal community, the academic community. They are also part of the they are also part of the audience that should be addressed. When we were in Mali, I spoke about Mali. What I did not mention during the outreach session in Mali, Timbuktu, 
is that we are also supported not only by our program partners on the ground, but also by the Canadian government. And um, I hope that by the end of this conference or this forum, I hope as a board, you would now consider the work that we do and through you to disseminate and garner support for the work of the Trust Fund for Victims. So I count on this August body to assist in, in promoting the work of the Trust Fund so that the, work, the, the fund could gain support. On the issue of the audience, I spoke, a lawyer came to me, now not in the Mali conference, but in the Dakar conference, Africa and the ISIS, the 20th anniversary. After presenting my paper, one of the young lawyers walked up to me and said, oh, I've read so many academic articles. And, and this comes to the point about audience. Uh, people speak about jurisprudence of this, jurisprudence of that. He says, but I've read the preamble to the home statute. It talks about victims. He says, it's good to build jurisprudence on the back of victims. What, what has actually been done for victims? So part of my submissions here today are informed by that question from that young man asking, what are we doing about victims? So in terms of audience, yes, I agree with you, Luis, that states have to be reached. They have to take their legal obligations. Their treaty obligations have to be taken seriously. But also, when I spoke about complementarity, I'm being biased here. I'm concerned with the right of victims to reparations and the right of victims to redress and justice within their domestic legal, within the domestic legal um, um, context of situation countries. So, in conclusion, um, I don't know if this is the time to make closing remarks. Do we have any opportunity to say anything again, Madam Chair? I think we have. Time for a few more questions. We've got someone standing up in the audience here, so perhaps we'll take a question. If you could identify yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Oksana Sinatrova. I'm Director of Research Center for Transitional Justice at Yaroslav Mudry National University, Kharkiv, Ukraine. I'm also a co-founder of uh, Foundation Sunflowers. Awareness of the ICC uh, activities is very high in Ukraine, as well as expectations um, concerning the results of the ICC uh, activities. I'm sure that now the court is overloaded with uh, communications from Ukrainian NGOs and individual uh, communications, in, uh, individual victims. And uh, given the lack of any cooperation from the Russian Federation, has the ICC developed any strategy uh, to inform the Ukrainian victims about the realistic possibilities uh, of the court in this situation? And in this regard, uh, does it make sense to develop a step-by-step -step strategy uh, of how the victim-centered approach should be implemented in every concrete situation. Thank you. Do you want to take one more question? Uh, Professor Stan, if you could add your question as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've been talking about outreach at the very start of the situation. I want to return to the very end of the situation and ask about the connection between outreach strategies and legacy strategies, how these two could be combined and how legacy strategies could be construed in a way that there are a two-way dialogue and just not a one-sided exposure of facts and events to the ICC. Uh, my second question relates to how you conduct outreach. We associate outreach with something active, but the court speaks also through its silences. So you produce effect when you don't say anything. So how do you keep track of the effects of your silences when you don't speak. And my last question relates to, I think, what Judge Pangalangan identified about who speaks and how the court speaks. I wonder whether 
letting the images of trials, scenes from the proceedings speak through itself. So if the court speaks through the voice of the others, that might be perhaps the most effective strategy to actually convey the message while not getting into the conflict which you've, uh, I think, very effectively outlined that the judges don't want to be seen, the court does not necessarily want to always be seen in, 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 in taking sides and positions, but also conveying, I think what is very important is the emotional aspects of ICC proceedings. It's not about rationality and judgment. It's about capturing, it's about capturing right, the, the atmosphere of the trial. It's, it's the, the emotions of the defendant. Those are really also the very important dimensions, I think, that we have to include, I think, when we talk about outreach. And they easily get sidelined if we say outreach is about communicating statements and just, just you know, taking note of what victims say, etc. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks uh, for the questions. Uh, I will address briefly the one of Ukraine in a very, in a very frankly way. And still, we don't have any st uh, any strategy in place for Ukraine. We will have it at one stage because it is we always have it. Uh, we don't have it yet because it's a it's a very special situation for us. It's, um, it's still we are in the middle of the conflict. Um, um, we have a still, or at least I have a still, a lot of uh, questions uh, that prevent us from um, doing a proper outreach uh, activity at this stage. But we are thinking of it. Uh, we are uh, considering different ways to do it. We are monitoring closely the situation. We are, uh, we are identifying possible actors. So we are on it, but we don't have at this moment a strategy in place. We'll have it at one stage. Now, with regard to the questions of Karsten, uh, you brought very interesting aspects. Uh, one is the issue of the legacy. Um, we are currently living, or we are in the last phases of um, uh, the proceedings, in the reparations phase, in some cases, in um, Congo, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, partially also in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, um, um, Uganda maybe at one stage. We have several countries where we are slowly uh, going out um, and we are working on the legacy and indeed the outreach is part of that whole concept and strategy of legacy. I have to admit that we are a bit delayed uh, late with that. It should have been done before and uh, better but we were aware it was just, again, a question of capacity. However, thanks God, we have still a, a person with a lot of years of experience in, uh, in Congo who is uh, working on it. Uh, the people in Uganda have also a lot of experience uh, with the court, and they are also working on it. So uh, there are strategies that are, uh, are in place. We are looking also at the examples, very good examples, of the Tribunal of the former Yugoslavia, as well as uh, Sierra Leone. And we will, look, uh, we will be working uh, into that direction. But we are already undertaking steps. With regard to the uh, to um, giving uh, sometimes the, the voice to others instead of uh, being the court, uh, the one uh, disseminated on conveying specific messages, it is always part of the strategies, part of the, of the outreach strategies. We consider in which situations it is better that is the court, the one conveying the messages, because sometimes um, you have more credibility among a specific uh, group or with a specific messages or at a specific moments of the proceedings and in some other occasions. And believe me, there are people in this room that have helped us with um, um, writing articles in newspapers, uh, uh, opinion, uh, interviews everywhere um, that were actually helping us in a coordinated way with us, let's say, to deliver some messages that the court was not in the position uh, to, to to deliver at, at that moment. Now, uh, the uh, question, and this is the last point that I want to address, the effect of the, uh, of the silences of the court. Indeed, uh, silences uh, sometimes say more than, than words. And um, I think that we are fully aware at the court that sometimes we are, uh, we are slow or uh, we, are, um, we have um, uh, silences that are uh, too long. And uh, in these moments, uh, as I mentioned before, um, when we don't uh, take the floor, um, very often others take it. 
and um, it is not always in the most positive uh, way. It is not, uh, we don't have very positive experiences on this. So I think this is uh, something in which uh, we need uh, to continue working. There is uh, room for improvement, let's say, sometimes in terms of um, uh, being a little bit uh, quicker or having a, a common position at the court in some moments. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Stan, for the, um, for, the, for the comment. I do acknowledge the courtroom is, is theater. And, um, uh, and to that extent, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the messages it sends, the, the didactic function of, of, of trials, uh, includes the, um, first and foremost, the, the existence of the public gallery. The idea that the public that this is a court that is transparent. We are prepared to show the public how we work. I mean, to the extent that it is um, uh, possible. And, and of course, that, um, that function is magnified several times over by, by the fact that today the public gallery includes not just the physical gallery uh, at The Hague. It can, uh, it can be seen by video uh, all over the world. Uh, f via a, a live uh, feed, via uh, a video uh, uh, recording. Uh, uh, Dr. Finnin earlier mentioned that um, uh, in, uh, in Uganda, the, the people uh, uh, were surprised that Mr. Ongoen was well-dressed and treated uh, fairly. Um, for me, nothing like uh, a picture paints a thousand words, uh, words and nothing like um, showing the accused um, uh, in, his, uh, in his seat uh, in, in the courtroom uh, and uh, in contrast, let us say, to the images that they might have assumed compared to local uh, practices where the uh, prisoners are not uh, uh, treated, um, uh, treated as well. And, uh, and uh, further, in my in agreement with, uh, with Karsten, I think uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the um, courtroom rituals, the ceremonial uh, aspects of, of a trial themselves do have uh, that that uh, that function of uh, showing the um, uh, it's part of the ideology, you know, the ma the majesty of the law, the neutrality of the um, of of the uh, of the judges, the role of um, of counsel uh, in presenting themselves before the court, in conducting uh, uh, trials, uh, eliciting the truth from from the witnesses. Um, so for me, uh, I do agree. It is important the um, uh, to to make the most of the didactic function of of the um, of, of the courtroom. I just want to close by saying also, I also wonder the effect of this on a lay audience who are following it. Uh, perhaps, uh, Professor Stein, maybe a lay audience might actually be a bit more impatient. Uh, like, um, it takes counsel to uh, 15 minutes to elicit um, one fact from, uh, uh, fr from the witness. Uh, and uh, they said, oh, I could have done that in Two minutes, but you know, it's, I mean, I'm just trying to imagine the, uh, the different effects of actually watching a live trial unfold before uh, one's eyes. But uh, yes, indeed, um, I, I do recognize that, that function of the trial. Thank you. I think we have about two minutes left, perhaps um, a comment or a question from Francisca. Perhaps a ra rather a comment, but I'm not sure whether Ibrahim wants to say something first. If, um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Francisca, you can speak about a uh, strategy on Ukraine at this initial, this early stage to respond to Kastin's question, and I'll respond to the second part of his question on legacy, outreach and legacy. Okay. Thank you, Ibrahim. And uh, yeah, I think we have now seen all the very many different aspects of outreach um, and uh, there's no easy answer to whose outreach and to whom. But the victim centeredness and the question of the Ukraine I just wanted to address. Um, this week, for example, um, we spoke together with the registry to the Banahus Foundation. So one of many organizations speaking at the moment to victims um, uh, in, uh, of the Ukraine conflict, one of many organizations collecting statements from these victims. And I think one of my key messages was not every of these victims will be a witness. 
Not every of these victims will have their story, their crime being told in a court of law. So it's very important to indeed have from the very beginning a clear um, understanding that collecting these stories will hopefully really also be for the purpose of giving some kind of reparations to these victims in whichever form it then will be, a kind of transformative uh, reparation. And I think especially in the situation of the Ukraine, where uh, the state is so strongly involved uh, from this very early stage on, to think together with all the different organizations involved in the country about something relating to reparations, a transformative reparation not necessarily comprehensive one, but a transformative one, is something we need to start thinking about together again. So, and here what comes in uh, is that, um, we discussed that uh, in the session before, that in engaging in the different situation countries, we have to really work closely together within the court, also for the messages, relating to the messages um, for the victims, how we cast that uh, together. I think that's really essential. And that's also what our board member Ibrahim has said in the very beginning of his uh, contribution. And thank you for that. Yeah. Do I still have time? Uh, we I, have about are we five running? Minutes We've got about five minutes, yes. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Francisca. Um, and as we emphasized in the early part of our submission, early intervention will be important. And thank you, Kastin, for the questions. Very practical, um, simple, but effective. Now, in relation to Ukraine, our executive secretary has spoken on what our strategy will be going forward or what, what steps we will take. But there are practical questions that people know that have arisen from, for lay people. I'm not talking about legal scholars and academics. I mean, issues have arisen in relation to the um, crime of aggression. When we talk about outreach strategy, and we talk about, I think the judge spoke about misinformation, which can affect the work of the court. But now is the time to identify those issues, issues practically and reach out generally in your outreach strategy, explaining for instance, what are the difficulties regarding certain areas? What is what, what what are the difficulties in the court exercising or in the prosecutor pursuing a crime of aggression? I mean, once the academic legal community, like Katzin, may know this, but the general public, and that is why I said at the beginning of my submission that the outreach is for who? It's for the beneficiaries and the beneficiaries of the home statute system. From what I see in the preamble, they are the victims. Principally, they are the victims and then other stakeholders. Um, so, and, and in relation to outreach and legacy, that's another good point, um, Kasten. Um, I think in the special court for Sierra Leone, when they were doing legacy, because it was an in-country tribunal, they were, when they were doing outreach, because it was an in-country tribunal, they were also factoring in legacy into the process. Legacy on judicial proceedings, legacy on the police, legacy on the, the rule of law system of the country. But this is where I think again the trust fund for victims become very important because post conviction or post acquittal in situation countries, who are the actors of the ICC that the people see? The trust fund for victims. And that is why I say when we engage countries, situation countries, even post acquittal and post conviction, we want to leave a legacy, a legal system whereby they've set up a legal system that caters for the home statute, the prosecution of crimes within the jurisdiction of the home statute, the amendments that have been made to the home statute, and also one that will cater for reparative justice, right to reparation and right to justice by other victims against other perpetrators. So this would all help enhance the home statute system. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I could make one brief remark before I turn it over to the chair to conclude. 
I think the question in the end is also what is effective outreach? And this is something that will change with time. I imagine there are technological tools that will make communication easier in other languages more securely and so forth. Maybe that's a discussion for the next panel about the court of the future. Um, so I will leave it there and I'll let you conclude. Thank you. In the course of the interventions from the panelists and also from, from the audience, I think we've been exposed to a lot of different understandings of what constitutes outreach and who is responsible for it. It is a very complex area. There are lots of different players involved in communicating in some way or another with affected communities and victims. And as Carsten pointed out, there's also a risk um, of leaving a vacuum where silence can be filled with misinformation or misunderstanding, ultimately inhibiting the ability of victims to understand the proceedings at the, at the court and be meaningfully engaged. So I thank the panel members and the audience for your participation in this in this session and I'll head back to, to Claire. Yes, and allow me to add my thanks to Dr. Finnan and the panel for the discussion. And to return briefly to the motion, ICC's outreach strategy is an effective dialogue with victims. Agree or disagree? If we return to the motion and the poll is closed and then we will see. 62% agree, it is an effective dialogue. I invite you to take a coffee outside. We will return in half an hour. Thank you. <laughs>